I want to talk about this amazing article which I found out the other day on Next.js and React which teaches you a lot of interesting things not only about React and Next.js but about security in general. So I want to go into depth of this article, see what I can find, share my insights, share my viewpoint of web security, things I know and uh, let's make this a good video for you for lunch time, for dinner time, whatever you are, whenever you are watching this. Let's provide some value, let's provide some valuable discussion, let's have some interesting concepts in this one. Alright, so this is a Next.js blog from Vercel, of course, which is a company which if you don't know about Vercel and Next.js, Next.js is a framework which is built on top of React.js, which provides a lot of batteries, right? So what it means is that you can't exactly do server side rendering with React alone. It gets a little tricky. It, there's a lot of syntax. There's a lot of verbosity. So what these frameworks like Next.js do is that they simplify the overall process. So at the end, the job of a framework like Next.js is to make lives easier at the both ends, the user end as well as the developer end. So the developer should also have a good time, you know, coding a website. So should the user, I mean, the user using the website, right? So this article is titled, how do you think about security in Next.js? And it starts with a few important things. One of the core focus of this article is on how to avoid accidental data exposure. Right now, one of the things if you know about RSC from my previous videos or in general is that you have a server, you have a server all the time with you, right? And then you also have a client. So the way this works, the way I see it working is that let's say this is your client computer, this is your server. When you send the first payload, you know, once a client asks that I want to visit this website, what does your server will give you is the index.html, right? Which is the first file it gives it then the server will start sending you script.js and all that good stuff which is actual react.js engine or what have you so script.js let's say this is also the asset now if we keep this timeline in order what's going to happen next is your client as a second step client will execute js right so it will execute the javascript it'll rehydrate react right the static html which your html files in so the step one was static files delivered and step two was client will execute javascript and rehydrate react then what happens in case of rsc at least is that you will have you know client will request for a pre-generated component. I won't even say pre-rendered because it's not exactly HTML, it's a different serialization thing. So it'll generate a pre-generated component from server, right? So the number three, this is the architecture which I'm telling you, this is about RSC, right? So let me also just clarify this real quick. It's not the regular React, this is React server components, right? So what this, what this makes is that once you have something like this, Static files will be delivered, so you'll get your HTML and JavaScript assets. Then uh, the client will execute JavaScript, rehydrate, react. Then depending on whatever the conditions are, the client will request for a pre-generated thing from server. This request will go, this will request will go to the server, right? So this is from client to server. And what server will do is that it will compute the component on the server itself, right? So it will compute the React.js component. So number four, which is of medium, let's see, compute the React component on server, hence RSC, right? That's how the name React Server Component is because it happens on the server. And then it sends it back to the client over here. Let's also move this inside. So overall, this is what happens, right? So this fourth step is where React is running on the server as well for computation. Now, what also happens in case of React Server Components is you can write code like this let me just go ahead and see if we have an example yeah so we have so see in react server components these server actions can also be created so what this means is that you can have code where in the function itself you are writing the block use server right so when you click on this this thing this button when you click on this this function gets invoked according to you now internally the react environment and everything is making its magic the next chase is doing some magic work to convert this function into an api call but internally what's happening is that let's say now on the client side you have a form right let's say you have a form on the client side so let's say user clicks on a form submit button 
right? So what's gonna happen if you have a model like this, when somebody clicks on this button, this code, this piece of code runs on the server. This piece of code runs on the client, right? Now here is where data security becomes important because you are mixing too much of client and server code together, right? So that's why I think one of the reasons is that you don't want your environment variables to be leaking. You don't want to send more than enough data here. Maybe you can also access your database object here. So you don't want all of that stuff leaking out, right? So this is this is a quick introduction to what and how on React server components and server actions work. But let's just start with this article now. And let's just try to look at what all we can learn from a few important things. So see, this article dives into three approaches which you can take as a developer when fetching data the first one is HTTP APIs which is the most common thing right and the way this works is that you as a user you as a developer what you do is that you create client of course you write some JavaScript you create a server as well so you would have something like this which is a server and you will create a meaningful API which you write on the client, right? So the server knows about this meaningful API. So this API could be slash API slash get user, right? So this is the traditional HTTP approach. The third approach, which is like component level data access is the one which I showed you right now, right? Where something like this is happening, where, you know, you are just doing or retrieving data directly at the, at the source where you need it, right? And the third one, which is, uh, also something which is data data access layer, which is, you know, you just creating probably a single turn or creating some sort of helper resolvers, which may or may not call HTTP APIs under the hood, but they just provide a level of abstraction over how you extract out data, right? So let's start with HTTP APIs. So see, personally, we at CodeDAM also use HTTP APIs all across. You see our own website, the codedam.com website is completely built with non RSC components as of now. So this part which you saw, this is built with regular statically generated. Then if you see, for example, this part which dynamically gets loaded in, this is from a backend call which this then gets which renders this UI then so we follow this model we follow the HTTP APIs model and the reason it works and it's very solid is that you would have a backend team or you can have people who you know know backend security and they secure the backend access for rate limits for user access for user authorization authentication everything right so one line important here is that they they tell you that explicitly if you are converting, let's say a website like this into the React server component, look out for any access control that assumes fetches from the internal network are safe, right? So what they are essentially saying in this, this whole paragraph, uh, as I understand, is that if you are migrating or implementing server components in a project like CodeDAM, for example, you can't assume that, you know, your data fetches or everything or anything is secure by default, if you are migrating. The best way is that you just assume that everything is, you know, everything is insecure in nature. So you can use cookies, of course, but don't just start accessing database or just start creating DB clients directly, right? Then why would you want to do this in the first place? Well, if you want to use RSC, for example, for rendering your components on the server, maybe that's why. The second approach, which is also the recommendation approach, recommended approach for new projects is to create a separate data access layer. So what this basically means, is it's a, it's a fancy way of saying that these are handlers where you just you know implement all of your validation all of your connection logic and everything and it's an abstraction layer over everything else right so you see that they tell you that you build an internal JavaScript library that provides custom data access checks before giving it to caller similar to HTTP endpoints but in the same memory model so the principle is that the server component function body should only see the data that the current user issuing the request is authorized to have access to right from this point normal security practice for implementing APIs take over which is like, you know, just passing the authentication tokens properly, you know, having a proper authentication mechanism in the first place. If you're using JWT, for example, use a, don't use a one, two, three, four, five, six key in production, things like these, of course. Here's this one thing uh, which is interesting in this blog article is that when they implemented this small thing, small utility, what they did is that they used a class 
they did not use a function or an object they did not return it and there's a reason for this they say that use classes to avoid accidentally passing the whole object to the client now the way rsc is developed it's a superset of json stringify if you want to understand that so if you take an object in javascript which is you know non recursive it does not bind on its own it's a, it's a relatively plain object it's not does not consist of functions and all you can json stringify it and pass it around right but react props are not javas json objects react props are javascript objects right so that can be more than just what json can represent therefore react server components use a different serialization protocol different serialization mechanism than just json stringifying and parsing it on the client and in their stringification the in their serialization classes are not supported right so why they returned a class from the current user is so that you can't just do something like return get current user right because if there is something which this internally this library let's say this also provides a bcrypt en encrypted hashed password of the user you probably don't want to send that right uh, down the stream what is the use of anyone seeing an encrypted password so in order to avoid that it's just a i i, I don't exactly like this approach but it's a hack that works at least in react server components for now is that instead of returning an object you just return a class and if you just do it you know if you just return the class object directly it just blow up in your face and you will know that you need to fix it there is also another interesting concept which versel or nextjs introduces is that they say that these methods which are you know some more methods get profile dto for example should expose objects that are safe to be transferred to the client as it is we like to call these data transfer objects dtos to clarify they are ready to be consumed by client so this is interesting because if you just sit down and you know if you just create everything create all these methods which are returning all the data and if you find out that hey anything which is ending in let's say dto data transfer object it's a safe object it's a safe function so you can just call it and return it as it is right however you can't do it with this get current user because it might give you a lot more information than the client you probably want the client to see right so as you can see now you can they, they tell you that once you have created a dto which is also in user data slash user dto dot esx you can just pass it around and you can just throw it back to the client another thing which is the component level data access which got very i would say it's it, it got memed out a lot on twitter the dev the dev, dev side of twitter was that you could potentially write sql queries like this in react components you know people were making jokes and memes about how you how you can use react to restart your computer as well which is technically possible because this can be used to do server side calls where server can invoke probably a bash command as well so anyway but you see this is a third approach where you just create a component you just you know fetch the data as it is and uh, <laughs> just just do it like this i mean it seems like illegal it seems like magic but it works with the react server component architecture as long as this is a server component it's not a client component but again you have to be careful with these things you have to you know you don't want to for example you see this profile component which is a client component this one is a server component so this gets rendered on the server you access this data on the server but the downfall here is that you are passing everything right to the client and of course you can have some sort of validation here but you would have to have those access control checks on your own right nobody's stopping you from just passing it down the whole thing at least above they just gave you a hint that this is how it should be you create a dto data transfer object use these functions and throw them directly instead of you know just doing something like this and plus just seeing this syntax makes me a little uncomfortable right uh, first of all because this query is not typed at all it's it's highly it's not insecure because this will sanitize it but it's just in it's just very hard to maintain if you actually look at a proper code base you will find that you can't code like this you need some level of type safety even in sql because you want to know what the return type would be if there is a table at all if there is a column name slug there in a production ready company i mean yeah, in any serious company you would have hundreds if not thousands of tables with tens of thousands of columns indexes foreign key relationships and everything and you want your ide to help and this syntax it's just it just doesn't look nice so yeah so that is one of the reasons but other reasons are of course like it's hard to data control this then of course there is another convention which you can follow you do something like this which also seems like a little bit of hack itself which is like a next js magic earlier i remember it used to be like i am not sure if it still is the case but you also can have file name.server.tsx 
and dot server will make sure that it's a server component you can also use import server only it'll just blow up again your build if you try to use it in a client based component and then there's an interesting api which is react and then there is an interesting api which is the react taint api which what it means what it basically means is that you can taint an object so what it basically means that you can just taint an object you know you just pollute or contaminate that object a little bit like the actual meaning of taint and that particular thing would not be able to you know go across the wire so react internally would make sure that if your final component is getting rendered with the tainted object it'll just blow up now of course you can clone this and create shallow copies and you know do things like these and it'll automatically you know untainted because you know in this case for example your object is technically broken right so these two are new copied values copied fields but objects in javascript work on a reference basis so that referential access is maintained when you you know do something like this and pass it so react understands that okay this was the same object i should probably block access to it maybe it works on reference maybe it works on some internal hidden property i don't know how exactly react taint works internally but there are multiple ways to protect against such, such a mechanism you can also have tainted strings or tokens you know just in case you you know you just taint all your environment variables and database keys and access and everything so that you by mistake take never even pass it down the client but again like i mean disasters can happen still you can uh, like it mentions that you can't just block derived values so maybe if you block the whole database string but you forgot to block the password then maybe you just can send the password so that can happen so next up is how do you read data in you know when you're using nextjs app router how do you read from database or apis a few things a few practices and one interesting bit again here is that they mention this Re rendering a server component should never perform side effects like mutation this is not unique to server components react naturally discourages side effects even if even when rendering client components so uh one thing which i feel one thing which is interesting here is that technically speaking react server components actually doesn't want you to have a analytics layer let's say which tells you the number of page views or you know the number of visitors you have on the render time let's let's imagine that you are using rsc for example completely outside of nextjs on your own you're implementing your own stuff so rendering a server component by nature should not perform a side effects like mutation increasing let's say a count of a page is a mutation let's say if you are just trying to implement some basic level of server analytics that how many page views i get on a certain page you would probably one way is that you know you just include it and in whenever that server component renders that is something react doesn't want you to do so this is this is yeah this is one thing which you probably should not do a lot of i have seen websites including like a few pages of ours which use like page views as one of the things or you know recording like number of views on this page inside a use effect usually a bad idea right there's a better way to do it outside of react so writes how do you perform writes well this is something which we also covered slightly but the way the recommended way in react js and next js is to use server actions server actions as i understand as i also showed you in the this thing it's a fancy way of replacing this abstraction that you create an api get user somewhere then you write the code there and then you execute it via an api call from the front end with a fetcher client of some sort um all of that is replaced by internally by next js itself so you create this function you say use server and then you just call that function like this right then you just call that function this works magically this works magically because internally nextjs somehow creates an api route which is what they call as server actions and they copy paste this code in that server action code it gives it the server environment which is like the you know the secrets and the database and everything it strips that away from the client it creates a fetcher object for you it performs that fetch request gets the response back and you know populates your variables so it works like magic under the hood only to avoid all the you know all the abstraction which by the way i think most of the world has no problem uh, because this is so common but i definitely agree like a setup like this can definitely increase the prototyping speed especially for setups which have like a full mono repo like the front end and back end is in the single repo for code dam at least we have two mono repos one is for complete for front end one is for complete for back end but for people who you know have a single mono repo this could be this could be like you know a game changer in terms of 
the number of code lines reduced because you know you just avoid every sort of fetcher and awaiting async await then doing all sorts of those things so that that is like that this makes just your code a little bit neater to read but again this comes with a with a caveat that you have to write this use server thing everywhere a block on csrf is also there so csrf stands for cross site request forgery that basically just means if you understand it if let's say if i want to explain it to you let's say you have a bank account with state bank of india let's say which is a popular bank in india let's say you're logged in into your bank right now bank interface net banking right now and let's assume that you can click one button which sends a post request to your bank website which then um, you know sends me one lakh rupees or hundred thousand dollars or whatever whatever your amount is in the bank what is stopping me from performing that api call right here why can't i just go ahead and write fetch https you know sbi dot whatever the domain is and then transfer mail even though you're logged in right even though you, if i open a new tab you will be logged in even if you're logged in i can't do this on this website because browsers implement certain mechanisms browsers implement certain techniques and things to prevent this cross-site uh, access right which is what they mentioned which is what they mentioned this behind the scenes server actions are always implemented using post and only this HTTP method is allowed to invoke them. This alone prevents most CSRF vulnerabilities in modern browsers, particularly due to the same site cookies being the default, right? What this means is the reason I can't do this is because your browser also needs cookies to authenticate to that domain. And browsers do not send cookies of a same, of a domain from a different domain. So if I'm making this request from nextjs.org, if I do this request, the fetch one, which I showed you to SBI bank from this domain, it will send the request. It, it's not like it will not send the request, but it will just not include the cookies until and unless I'm on the same website again, right? But even though, even in that case, for example, if you have a multi-tenancy setup like Vercel, even in that case, if you want to prevent CSRF attacks, the way to go about is that you include a CSRF token. CSRF token is a randomized token, which is present one time. It just changes when you refresh. What it does is that it makes your form submission secure. Why? Because now, even though if I can somehow magically perform that fetch request, even if I'm on the same domain and everything, I don't know that random token, right? Because that random token is generated only when you visit that form. And when you visit that form that is generated for your session, so it's stored in server's memory or wherever and only you as a client and server would know that so when you exchange that request server validates that this yes this is a legit request it's not coming from anywhere else so most i think if not all top websites at least the banks and everything they have very strict csrf implementations and everything but if you're using server actions you have to remember that it doesn't use csrf tokens as a default thing therefore html sanitization is crucial Plus, I mean, this is one of the things where um, I don't know if you would even come across this at all because you don't have the control of the API you are using, right? So you, uh, internally, you will just do something like this. Not, not exactly this. Internally, you will do something like just this. But how do you even ensure CSRF in this, right? There is no way to ensure because you don't have access to any sort of server memory, for example. And... Uh, I mean, there could be ways, there could be ways. I, if I look at this code long enough, I'll figure out, I'll play around and I'll figure out something. But it's not very obvious, right? Which you would, you, which you, which you would see in a regular API. Then finally, one more section which I liked in this blog was the auditing path. So, you know, if you have completed your PR or, you know, you're migrating from pages router to Next.js app router, this is a good checklist to go through. Use client files, use server files, you know, make sure that component props are expecting private, if they are expecting private data, you know, just make sure everything is tight in your client components. Your server files are a little bit more relaxed because you know that, you know, they are running on servers. But of course, as always, you have to check for authorization and authentication. You have to understand the importance of validation and, you know, sanitization in general. And of course, make sure your middlewares and your routing is proper in nature, right? All in all, I think this is an interesting blog which tells and teaches us. All in all, I think this is an interesting blog which teaches us a lot about Next.js, React, RSC, security in general. What do you think about this? What's your view on Next.js and React server components in general? We have been talking a lot about it recently. Let me know your thoughts below. That's all for this one. I'm gonna see you in the next video really soon.